Good evening. Well, uh, welcome to the last lecture of the Spring 90 lecture series. Um, uh, I'd just like to thank a few people um, who've really helped us out. Um, all the people in the Media Center who've put up with every sort of problem and, and uh, really fared very well and helped us out. And uh, Rosemary Rabin for helping us take care of everything. And uh, Michael for allocating funds and all that sort of stuff. And I'd like to thank Neil Denari for being our advisor this semester and helping us get it all organized and finding phone numbers and chasing people down. And uh, tonight it's Kaplan and Kruger and, uh, and Neil Denari would, will be introducing them. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think it's been a good semester for uh, lectures and we've got an interesting pair of architects to kind of tie it up. Um, uh, Kaplan and Kruger uh, are from uh, New York, though not originally um, the Midwest and New Jersey. Uh, and they've been in partnership since uh, graduating architecture school uh, in the mid-80s uh, um, from Columbia. Uh, which is which is where I know them from, and um, I think a, a bit of a personal selection here, at least uh, as far as these guys being on the on the circuit. Um, we uh, organized our own uh, little uh, meeting group in 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 Manhattan in uh, five, six, seven years ago, talking about ideas which were of uh, mutual concern, um, questions of technology, legitimacy. Uh, architectural practice itself, etc. Um, and I think that their work, which has uh, developed from one sort of thing to another sort of thing, um, challenges a lot of questions or makes us think about a lot of things uh, that maybe we take for granted um, and explore uh, ideas and relationships of, say, politics and sociology. Um, which is what their backgrounds before architecture were in. Um, and I think that the work is, um, I think, challenging also at the level of the, uh, what they call the, the, the analog, uh, the thing which is neither a uh, model nor a representation, um, but is artifactual, or as they say, that is, is the version of instrumentation, architecture's version of instrumentation. Um, and uh, I think that their, their denial of, of, of uh, uh, convention in many ways and their experimentatious attitude is, I think, one of the more uh, commendable uh, aspects. Uh, they'll both be talking um, uh, separately, um, and uh, Ted Kruger will begin, and Ken Kaplan will follow. Please welcome them. As is customary, we'd like to thank uh, people who were instrumental in bringing uh, us here. Since we've heard a lot of that already, we'd just like to say thanks to Neil and Larry, uh, particularly for the emergency coffee infusion late in the day. Uh, Rosemary and Diane and the other people who we haven't heard about yet who have probably done a great deal to make sure that this thing happened. Um, other than that, I think we'll just begin. Um, those lights could go. Yeah. Thank you. KK Research and Development was established in 1986 and is currently located above a taxi mechanic on the lower west side of Manhattan. This organization, exclusively our collaboration, exists as a laboratory for our ideas and their immediate application. More than a shop or studio, the laboratory is a place to learn that which the schools would not teach and to unlearn the things which it did. The formation of this laboratory grew out of our discontents with the options available to us in the discipline, either commercial practice or academic uh, research and instruction. I'd like to show several uh, pieces to begin that uh, are not on our main topic, which is the renegade cities. Um, these uh, projects will show you a bit of how we developed uh, to the point 
uh, of doing uh, analogs that Neil uh, mentioned earlier. This is an early uh, work. Prior to the formation of our laboratory, Ken and I were working with another classmate of ours, Chris Schultz, um, who also went to school at Columbia. And we chose sort of a traditional route for the recent architectural graduate, uh, furniture design. This table uh, is uh, one that turns into a lamp. Um, you saw it in the position where it would work as a table. Here it's folded up, um, standing, and uh, it becomes a light. This uh, project, project, while somewhat seductive and, and really quite successful, um, brought to mind for us uh, certain questions. Uh, it became difficult for us to justify uh, designing a table which probably costs about $30,000 to build. Uh, we couldn't really figure out who we were designing this thing for and why. <laughs> but it, it was kind of a nifty item, you know. Um, furthermore, this is a model and not really the thing itself. And we found that a bit frustrating, essentially. Another project which we undertook um, was this uh, baby stroller and its accompanying garage. Uh, the garage is uh, for us a flexible spatial enclosure that could be laid on its side um, or moved around the house and spread over with blankets to become a, a playing place for the child. Uh, and the stroller uh, we saw as sort of a, um, a tool cart for the child. Uh, the time, at the time this project was undertaken, Ken and I both uh, were in the process of having uh, children and uh, assisted by our wives, of course. And um, <laughs> so these things were of concern to us, um, particularly in looking at things that were available to children. We found, found that um, most of it was pretty bad and didn't really uh, do much in terms of preparing uh, children for what we saw uh, the society uh, would be like in, say, 20 years. Uh, this uh, side of the stroller we call the buzz wall. It contains a lot of tools and uh, equipment that the child could use to uh, explore the environment as dad uh, pushed them around the park. Um, uh, it contains uh, uh, compasses, uh, calipers, and, and uh, very simple instruments that one could use to measure um, the, uh, the environment and so on. For us, this piece is about the relationship between the, an individual and society, uh, in particular about a child and the relationship uh, with a culture that would not exist for another two decades. Um, with it, we hope to describe a strategy of, of direct contact is, with the environment and direct manipulation of the environment, rather than the passive uh, experience of it through a cathode ray tube, for example. And for us, it became clear, too, that we need to uh, control and understand our own environment uh, and eventually to uh, seize control of the technologies um, that we wanted to use and distort them for our own purposes. So at that point, conceptually, for us, the shop became a laboratory. <laughs> uh, not all the experiments are successful. Uh, and the method uh, of our, the nature of the projects changed and uh, we developed somewhat idiosyncratic working method. Um, I'd like to enumerate some of the ideas and methods of our laboratory that we feel have divorced us, not only from the rules and regulations of conventional practice in the schools, but particularly from the traditional modes of experimentation currently promoted by many designers and professorial types. Late modernists, postmodernists, constructivists, deconstructivists, and neo-machinists all have their proponents ringing the corporate doorbells e eager to be yeast in the dough of capitalism. These commercial practitioners have a personal style developed out of an idiosyncratic exploration of ideas that has since been abandoned to accommodate the client. Here, innovation has short-term motives rooted in the desire to differentiate oneself from the pack. Or stated more bluntly, the new signature style is more, no more than a marketing technique in order to jack up sales. In contrast, many of our sometimes and inconsistent methods, uh, three will stand out as fundamental to our brand of laboratory procedures. The direct manipulation of materials. We do not draw. Instead, we work directly with the materials at hand in the lab. The range of materials is drawn from diverse sources, from industrial samples to dumpster pickings, whatever is cheap and available and adaptable to the ideas we are exploring at the moment. False starts are common. 
rejected work is set aside or scavenged for uh, parts are sometimes incorporated directly into another work. Nothing is drawn up before we start and as built are not produced when we finish. The direct manipulation of ideas, or what we call raving. Our laboratory offers a similar opportunity for the exploration of words and ideas when theory, principles, text, and letters to the editor are replaced by the rave. The rave is a high flame, low fat verbal barbecue where ideas about the work are directly roasted. Internalized <laughs> self-reflection serves no one. Minutes of the meeting are not taken. Deans and office managers would have no truck with our rantings, nor would they appreciate the serious intent behind these means to harness the full force of ideas. The subversion of technologies. When we find an abandoned Xerox machine, it'll likely bring it back to the laboratory for an autopsy. The purpose of this dissection is twofold. First, to understand its functions and to ascertain its dysfunctions. And second, to appropriate its vital parts for transplant into our own creations. Lithium grease replaces formaldehyde in this laboratory. Parts are sorted by mechanical function, shafting, switches, motors, and so on, and stored for reuse. Only the housings are discarded because we have no use for industrial design. What was once a one-liner consumer product becomes a psychopolitical nuisance, some of which you'll see in a moment. This is a stereo act here. Uh, for us, uh, bending aluminum and disemboweling computers and raving are the primary means to an end, the production of analogs. Analogs, as Neil quoted us, we're quoting him now, analogs are architectural equivalent of instrumentation, an oscilloscope applied to the pulse of the cultures in question. Analogs subvert appearances. They're not models, nor are they intended to convey abstractions. Rather, they provoke an understanding of the connections between materials and political and psychological states. They may often be considered ideological test samples of the cultures to which they are applied. For example, this analog built for the School of Architecture at Columbia. By the way, this was a, one of, uh, of a group of work uh, which uh, Neil Denari and, and Peter Fallon West Jones were also involved in called Installed Mechanisms. And this was at Columbia about uh, three years ago. Uh, this particular piece, uh, where you're looking in from the Avery Library of Columbia, commemorates the student suspended between the real world, here represented Oops, there's a slide missing. But this, it's represented by the real world. There's a, this uh, piece is hanging in a skylight. Above it is the campus plaza. And below is the studio review, review spaces. And this is a shot from the library. And, and at the eye level of the library, the analog can eye, eye the morgue of history where the, pro, the Prix de Rome is a Xerox away. At, interv at certain intervals, determined by the timing motors, reciprocating motor motors cause this piece to rock violently, as if vacillating between the equally valid, the sometimes invalid, ideological positions of the jurors below. A after each review, the work comes to re rest, skewed to one side or the other, and stares panting into Avery Library as the bookworms attack the Vitruvian club sandwiches within. After a short time, the cycle repeats. Time, timers activate lighting uh, and motors at irregular intervals. The movement of the motors through linear actu actuators upset the balance, causing the suspended work to pitch from side to side and cast a moving beam of light up through the plaza. The light had fell off. Uh, didn't hit anybody, though. After each of these periodic outbursts, the object comes to rest, while the blowers rhythm rhythm rhythmically inflate and deflate a latex bladder attached to the frame. This is the shot from the review space. For us, the student is not only caught in tension between these spaces, but as well between the ideological positions of a fundamentally political nature. The content for these positions, the co context for these positions could be on the axis of the academic and commercial, or the wider ground of large-scale political systems. We create an analog to help you see the red exit signs of this ideological zone. Behind the establishment of our laboratory and the production of analogs, 
reigns a larger purpose that defines the core of our research efforts. We are interested in experimental politics and to this end have produced a body of work known as the Renegade Cities. We are in a period when large-scale political systems have proven to be all but clinically dead. Formerly pregnant with all sorts of utopian promise, Western state capitalism and communism and their Asian hybrids had given birth, perhaps from too much radiation, to their defective children. Lumbering, dull-witted, and corrupted bureaucracies, mindless of the individual will, turn, na nationalists, turn into national serial killers when provoked. Revisionist talk shows, daily on the airwaves, and even exciting acts of resistance, like in China, are a mere rash on the buttocks of these large managerial cultures. In response to this global condition, the Renegade Cities Project, by means of the analogs, is an experiment in innovative political methods as an alternative to these stalemated ideologies. These methods include the formation of small-scale, politically volatile cultures outside the bounds of national territories. Much of the burden of historical inertia has been removed by their location on the surface of the sea, below it, or in orbit, and by their mobility. This physical isolation is counterbalanced by telecommunications technology. Physical isolation, in this case, need not be coupled with backwards uh, technology or culture, and indeed, these communities may well be the most advanced of all. These cities will serve as political laboratories, incubators for ideas that could inform or challenge their larger scale step parents. The Renegade Cities is not intended to be a comprehensive zoo incorporating all possible beasts that might emerge from hormone injections into these genetically altered cultures. Rather, we have selected from our own interests and from the means and materials at hand a number of possibilities which we feel will serve as starting points for individual speculations in sympathy with or reaction to those we illustrate. These are not future cities, but exist at present in the minds of those who choose to participate. This project is undertaken despite the unfashionability that visionary urban projects have had during the last 20 years. The high incidence of social problems in certain low-income housing projects discredited not only modernist planning principles, but large-scale planning in general. Contextual and infill projects have dominated the intervening years leaving the profession without strategies for dealing with the scope or rate of change facilitated by a variety of technologies, especially information science and communications. These cities are innovators, scavengers, opportunists, and ultimately renegades, populated by self-selected boomers and backyard astronauts, mortgaging the future for a toolbox, a personal computer, and a shot at it. These cities are the product of both advanced engineering and late-night do-it-yourselfers populated by fugitives from the impotent ideologies of land and nations. Prototypes are patched into prefabricated assemblies and solder replaces the weld. These cities regenerate by accretion, cell division, birth, and vomiting. The renegades will find their own way. The city had its origin in a group of specialized platforms for telecommunications, transportation, aquaculture, and offshore mining and refining. It was populated by an odd mixture of roustabouts, hackers, lab technicians, and a new breed of fishermen. But after having ventured into international waters in search of new mineral deposits, there were those iconoclasts who discovered instead a trade in duty-free goods and in other uh, lucrative recreational activities. As a result, tourism developed into an important sector of the economy and several high-technology multinationals set up shop to exploit the vanguard image and to evade taxes, each with its own hermetic manufacturing platform. Soon research institutes were founded in a predictable range of disciplines. The summit and junket crowd showed up to find facts, shake each other's hands, and the appearance of so many politicians in a place that had had so few started many of the old timers talking about setting things right or moving on. This is an analog of the oil can city flanked on either side by uh, pig heads. Pig heads for us represent the context within which the renegade cities uh, would exist in international waters. This work consists of two aluminum castings suspended in confrontation with each other. Each head contains a tape recorder and a speaker that simultaneously broadcast uh, ideological driver, drivel produced by capitalist and communist uh, bureaucracies. New batteries will not restore the inaudible, inaudible banality of this debate. It might be pointed out that recent political developments which have occurred since the work is done um, would uh, counteract 
the opposing ideologies. Uh, we would say, however, that these developments have just reinforced the look-alike nature of, of this debate. The oil can analog was assembled from components scavenged from photocopiers, motorcycles, material handling hardware, and is suggestive of the construction tactics practiced by the first inhabitants of the renegade cities. This patching together of incompatible technologies, a useful emergency room procedure for a city in labor, fails to ensure survival over the long term. Ultimately, oil can becomes a launching platform for more advanced experimentation of increasing technological sophistication and political adventure. This is Bureau Dicto, short for the dictatorship of the bureaucracy, another renegade that emerges from the socio-chemical solution of these experiments. It's the largest and most organized of the renegades. It is aquatic and mobile, feeding off the cool waters of the Alaskan panhandle. Resembling the cro hybrid crossbreeding of a marine invertebrate with the executive offices of a multinational, it slithers along the surface of the ocean looking for that perfect wave. <laughs> Bureau Dicto has perfected techniques of conflict resolution in order to maintain an ideal steady state condition. The population of life insurance salesmen, credit card application examiners, sushi chefs, and vegetable rights activists <laughs> is kept sedated, kept sedated by 24-hour HD TV programming consisting of early morning aerobics, fundamentalist evangelism, and year-long infotainment telethons. <laughs> the increasing levels of information noise threatens the population with sen sensory overload. Bureau Dicto assists by providing a selective filtering service for the populace. This keeps them from spending too much time sorting things out, resulting in a remarkable increase in productivity and a decrease in blood pressure. Many architects get their inspiration from outside the discipline. Um, we're no different at KKR&D. The inspiration for this project came from, not from linguistic theorists or other Frenchmen, but from a stall at the Red Dog Saloon in Juneau, which said, if you're not the lead husky, the scenery never changes. <laughs> if you don't get that, we'll explain it after the... Uh, we have a slide we didn't show them. Um, this is excellent. Actually, this is the lead, lead husky here. As, as part of our research, uh, we speculated about a special breed of city, which we call the mosquitoes. Um, these cities specialize in short-term, small-scale political structures capable of rapid, rapidly acting out hypotheses. Essentially, mosquitoes reject steady-state politics or ideologies that are inherently incomplete, transient, and unstable, which, but which provide certain benefits over the short haul. Within three generations, mosquitoes adapt to any pest pesticide. The first uh, mosquito we call Gigabips uh, is the fastest growing of, of the mosquito cities and relies on the power of parallel processors to supply insatiable demand for data required by the multi-volume impact studies of mainland governments. Makes a lot of money doing that, I'm sure. Uh, both politically and economically, complex tasks are broken into subroutines and distributed to individuals or small groups to work on whenever they get up. While most of the data is useless, no one reads the studies and Gigabips continues to thrive famously. This is another mosquito called DARPA DOA. And DARPA is, is a uh, nomenclature for the Defense Department's research division and DOA is a, another Defense Department term for dead on arrival. Uh, DARPA DOA is a roving military outpost marketing advanced research in electronics weapon systems to third world nations. The municipal government sends representatives to college campuses to recruit trainees enticed by guarantees of glossy photos of the B-2 self bomber and lunch at its famous revolving restaurant. That top piece revolves, the restaurant that is. Uh, this is uh, Avalanche City. Uh, Avalanche City, unlike its 
ex extroverted predecessor, Oil Can City, thrives on covert and paranoid behavior in order to survive. The initial settlers, a disenchanted party of nuclear power specialists and public landfill inspectors, established a settlement near the site of a former rock slide, actually up near Buffalo, New York, in an attempt to grab unmarketable property and as a general warning to others to stay away. By means of electronic mail, they are able to make contact with other similarly excommunicated bureaucrats who also are sick and tired of aerobics, opinion polls, and year-end year closeout sales. As a direct reflection of this population, the city develops an arsenal of defense mechanisms in order to ward off invasion of former incipient ideologies and falling rocks. Electronic surveillance equipment, baggage checks, and tongue lashings characterize an urban culture that must continue to arrest its growth to prevent exposure and even extinction. As an economic base, the city exports a number of services and products that benefits both government and private industry and their need for se seismic detection and security technologies. In fact, the rapid success in these fields leads to the grumbling among the old-timers who fear economic stability will trigger an avalanche. Uh, avalanche City is a, actually a commission work uh, that was commissioned by an organization called Art Park, which is a state-funded art facility in New York State near Buffalo. And this is the first proposal, too. Uh, this particular piece would be constructed of uh, a 22-foot welded steel frame sheathed in aluminum plate. Uh, the sculpture incorporates a, a series of interactive mechanisms that would be controlled by a computer and would be triggered by infrared sensors located within the vicinity of the sculpture. Uh, as I said before, a, an intruder would activate this piece. There's a 20 uh, spines, which are actually would be motorized uh, car antennas that would move in and out if, if a uh, tourist came near to the piece. There's also this dangling proboscis, which is an industrial cable carrier, and that would drop down below uh, in, in front of a viewer. And then the roving eyeballs would also scan the, uh, in, a, in its paranoid way, scan the entrance of, a, of an onlooker. Uh, unfortunately, the insurance uh, liability people uh, decided that we couldn't use this site and sent this city into Chapter 11. Uh, so we had to change the location to the other side of this knoll uh, and suspend it between two points, two, two knolls, so that uh, uh, there would be a more secure uh, anchoring of the piece. In fact, we have to use concrete and trees instead of a falling rock. Uh, this is the well, side, side view of it. Uh, of course, a new city requires a new idea and a new name. And this one we call Kunstfart Dam, which is a first of a series of imported Euro trash urban cultures <laughs> designed to elevate backwater townships. Uh, since Kunstfart Dam, and that's Estonian German, and you speak, hoping none of you speak that, but since uh, Kunstfart Dam is a prototype, its designers over speculated the amount of paranoia necessary to make this nationalist society perform like the norm. In fact, this culture's nerves are so taut, they trigger alarms and warning lights at the sight of a potential tourist. As a result, its newly constructed opera house has become a storage for millions of unsold black Italian fashions and boxes of unread post-structuralist art journals. Uh, Kunstfart Dam is, is uh, constructed of a 30-foot long aluminum angle truss, similar to the other one, but eight feet longer, and a sheath in a sheet aluminum and plexiglass. Uh, the similar kinds of structures, uh, mechanisms are inside as well as the computer would also be located in, in the head of the piece. Uh, this piece we will be building this summer at our park and uh, the idea is that we will actually go up there and construct it ourselves and then it's up for the, for the summer and then we take it down. Uh, I'm wondering if some of you are tired of the same old academic uh, casserole. Well, we've created for you a piece called Rolotex, which is a theory Cuisinart. Blends, <laughs> chops, mixes, dices, purees, dogma. <laughs> now, we have a special low price for you at SciArc. You no, know, all the Eastern schools have one of these. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
and I think you should have one. Uh, the way it operates is two drums rotate in opposite directions. One contains a subject and another a predicate of well-known philosophical statements. Uh, the critic can switch off the appliance, creating all kinds of new and mindless knowledge ready to serve the starving students. There's 50 statements on, on this, this piece and, and we, you can get up to 300 uh, permutations. Some of the ones we've brought you tonight, which we are uh, able to puree. House is the opiate of the people. Revolution is the machine for living. And God is in the text. Uh, uh, in conclusion, the renegade cities exist, exist initially because they are overlooked or are of no consequence to the superpowers. Eventually they become a force to be reckoned with as their power increases and the toxicity of their ideas becomes manifest. They exist because they are able to produce commodities of value to the superpowers. Essentially, they hold out these goods for the ransom of their own autonomy. For us, architecture and politics are both experience-based systems. They are applied disciplines. What is called political science can only be descriptive at best. Politics is a technology. When a prescriptive theory of politics is developed, in essence, an ideology, it is immediately corrupted in application. Architecture, produced under the tyranny of the rule book, whether one, one of its own, or one bar borrowed from another discipline, as currently is the fashion, is fundamentally limited. Pigs are domesticated. We eat them. Mosquitoes, they eat us. This is not an argument about size. Rather, it is about the speed at which tentative hypotheses can be tested. That which works is kept and retested in combination with other ideas. It's simply a better way to think and to well. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> Please. <laughs> what do you guys do to read? <laughs> well, we go. We, we, we do the lectures, and after the lectures, <laughs> no, uh, we, we uh, no, Ted and I both work. Uh, I work in, uh, it's a factory uh, environment called Teaching Architecture in Columbia, and Ted works in a, an office in New York, uh, Sal McCown. So we both work full time on our jobs and, and spend our nights and weekends uh, Pulling down in the in the lab, raving and welding, and whatever. So it's uh, don't worry, no one's funding us uh, on a permanent basis. So we're, <laughs> other than ourselves at this moment. When the opportunity comes up, yeah. Yeah, we've uh, we'd like to certainly. Oh, she asked if we we're going to publish this uh, piece of writing. We'll put it through the uh, Rolotex, maybe. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys uh, actually get down to putting this stuff together, um, for instance, if you have like a you know, I'm sorry, I can't can't hear you. It really, really depends on whether, whether what the thing is, or if we need more information about it in order to use it. Um, the best way to get information about what a thing is is to, is to take it apart, understand how it works, how it was designed, and all that sort of stuff. Um, you can learn a great deal. I mean, the, just a simple thing like a Xerox machine, for example, the engineering uh, that goes into that is really an amazing thing when you take it apart with your own hands understand how it works. Um, on the other hand, sometimes it's not necessary to know how it works in order to use it. Um, we, we tend to have, as you saw on the slide, a lot of stuff sitting around in the shop. Uh, this often isn't as organized as it might be. 
and those coincidental juxtapositions can often be useful. Um, but some of the stuff is found, some of it's made specifically for the purpose, some of it's purchased particularly for a purpose. Um, the stuff comes together in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I was just curious about the relationship between the, between what, between the meaning and the material. Sometimes there's some and sometimes there's... Yes? Yeah. I think, I think what we, the goal that we have in mind with a project like the Renegade Cities is to propose uh, for people who see this thing that there could be other ways to run a nation or a community or a government um, and that these large scale structures that we're all sort of living under right now are, are outmoded 19th century propositions uh, that are carried through with this incredible amount of inertia based on on the fact that the United States owns this land and we're going to run things a certain way here. Uh, what we tried to do is create a proposition that said, look, when, when you leave some of those areas and you go out on your own um, to places like the surface of the sea or the Arctic or in outer space or whatever you might be doing, there are opportunities there to think about organizing uh, societies in a different way. So we've made some, we've made some propositions that are serious and, and not so serious uh, that you might like or might not like um, but hopefully you would uh, engage in some speculation from your own perspective mm. well that, that, that thing that DARPA DOA thing was just crazy that shouldn't be that way it should be like this when the should be like this happens then you're taking the initiative to think about right. how society is organized yourself yeah, I mean, in ways that may not happen if you just exist in this uh, the warm waters we live in, you know. Yeah, and, uh, this this show is just uh, recently finished uh, uh, exhibiting in, in Frankfurt and Hamburg. Um, we're yeah, yeah. yeah the, the Renegade City project. It was it was it was exciting for us to take these ideas. We when we do this stuff, we. We basically build stuff in the shop and we know that we're going to show it someplace in New York eventually or whatever. So, uh, but to take this thing over to Europe, first to, to Frankfurt approximately a year, about a year ago, uh, and show it there and get a different reaction uh, than what we were used to in New York. And then later, given the political changes in Europe during the last, last year, to bring that thing back and show it in Hamburg again and to get the reactions was very exciting. And uh, they, they read the stuff, you know, there was no question about it. These people knew what we were talking about and it, and it was exciting for them and for us to engage in the discussions. What, what is the significance of the orange umbilical cord that seems to run through all your work? Uh, the orange part of it or the uh, umbilical cord? <laughs> You, these, these long uh, power cords are really not very expensive right. and you know <laughs> if you don't have a lot of money a lot of times you reuse them too right. you know, so and black is sort of an Italian uh, color we use yes staying this question um, staying in the purely sort of theoretical realm your, your cities as objects in nature what role do you see them playing as an object Still theoretical, right? That's not the real world. Um, what Where? Where is that? What role do you see your objects playing in nature? Besides, what, what do you see them? What, what kind of dialogue do they carry with nature? Or any? Do they feed off that? Or do they feed off that? Well, I think I think the primary place we see uh, the object having a dialogue is with 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 other human units, as opposed to a tree or when we have something, say, at Art Park. We, we intend to put something up there. It's going to be in very much in nature. Uh, it's going to be slung between two cliffs and hanging right out there over the river and so on. Um, and that's nice, but basically it's a dialogue between a person who walks up to it and, and, the, uh, and the world. Yeah, I, I don't, in our minds, I don't think we divide uh, 
uh, you know, the natural world from human nature, or, you know, there's, and more importantly, the people who can react and, and do something about it are, you know, are people. These are the issues that we're, we're interested in. I think uh, when we originally, uh, we originally got a grant to do, from New York State Council on the Arts, to do a future city. That was the initial idea for Renegade Cities. And we actually picked a site in New York State, and we had bu bubble domes and monorails and, you know, every, everything you, you think would go into a future city. And we, we rejected that. We thought that was, uh, that you couldn't, um, inherently design a city. You know, it's just ridiculous for two guys or one guy or any number of people to sit down and physically design that. And it, what was more interesting uh, were the under, underlying uh, power structures of cities, and particularly cities on land. You know, where are you going to put a new city on any land right now? So this led to the idea of going outside the international boundary zone where there could be a possibility of a new polit political adventure. And uh, that became much more interesting. And then working with, with uh, the pieces took on that character in terms of what they might be. Well, we're, we're, fami we're familiar with that, that stuff for a long time. Um, we, we, had, we had also, both, Ken and I both had, uh, had done research in Alaska in, in former lives, and uh, so we, we knew <laughs> Well, you know, he, he did this thing with uh, studying the Alaskan pipeline, and I got a, a fellowship from Columbia to study architecture up there. And so we, we, we had this common experience with Alaska. Okay. And when we got bored with New York State, we, we decided to move this thing up to the coast of Alaska. We knew about oil platforms. I mean, everybody sort of knows about this stuff. And, and we had looked into other technologies for aquaculture and, and telecommunications and all that other good stuff. Uh, and all these things exist. I mean, these things have, have been tested for years. They're, they're nice mobile platforms. You can just buy them off the shelf from Exxon, small fee. And, you know, it's, it's out there. Uh, what became more interesting for us is once you get off the land and into the water and you sneak over that imaginary line where you're no longer in the United States but you're not quite in the Soviet Union or Japan or any place else. And while, you know, technically I'm sure somebody governs that or, you know, somebody's got bombs out there for that, What's the possibility in that? That became the exciting thing. Now we can make up our own rules. And uh, that opens up a whole new area of speculation, which we, that was really the inspiration, the realization for us. You're making up your own rules out there in international waters. What's to prevent somebody else from making up a different set of rules? Absolutely. Well, that's, that's, that's what, what we're after. Yeah. That's what mosquitoes are about. You're, you know, mosquitoes are, exist, they're short term. They, they make a bunch of rules and then they, you know, they burn them up. I mean, it, it, it's really, it, it seems to me that the, the power and uh, the need to be flexible within the options is really important. On the other hand, you know, to pick a direction and go after it, you know, I think is something else that doesn't get uh, asserted enough. You know, so I think it, it's, it's a two-sided sword. Any other? <laughs> Ken, you want to deal with B? I mean, I, you're, the, you're the academic here. That's yeah, well, no, spatiality. I mean, I uh, you, know, I, you know, I teach in an architecture school, and, and there, you know, I, I, there's a lot of the issue of what space is in architecture sort of is in, uh, Well. Right. They're not. They're not architecture. Uh, but that's up to you to. I mean, we're not here to define, uh, put it on one side of the fence or the other. I mean, you, you can uh, judge that for yourself. I think what's important is that they deal with. You know, they provoke you to think about things that could be architectural. It could be any number of things. More importantly, architecture is bounded by politics. You know, many students. Uh, in school, they get a site, and they look at the site, and they don't think about who owns the site, you know, who's responsible. There's amazing complex governmental forces and ideologies governing not only the site, but the design you may be using for that site. 
you need to think about that and what the role that's going to play in choosing how you're going to deal with that. But that, you know, th these are, what? The accreditors in the school call that section <laughs> But I think, I think you, the point that what we do is oriented towards object, objectness as opposed to creating space is true. Uh, part of that comes about because of the opportunities that we have to, to do work, to exhibit work, to get the ideas out there. Um, and, uh, you know, when opportunities come where more spatial things could be developed, for example, this piece at Art Park, which is it's 30 feet long and so on and so forth, that will, that will contain some kind of space. It's almost a habitable size. So then, then the nature of the work could change to, right. to investigate more spatial, spatially oriented ideas. But right. right now that's, you know, it's sort of working like this, uh, and, and, and you're not doing a model. Right. The space inside gets to be rather limited. But it's not furniture. <laughs> one last um, the, the analog allows you a kind of center line to uh, represent, let's say, something political. Uh, not only it represents the object, it's not a model, it is the real artifact. There's nothing outside of it. Um, in that regard, the, the, the challenge is for our occupation, whether or not con uh, psychologically, physically, etc. Um, yet, the objects have suggested qualities. And the text, at least as I know it, has, has appeared for the first time as description, but it doesn't ever talk about, let's say, the question of technology. Uh, one, what, what is your position on, quote, technology, either what it might represent outside of the object, or what are the interests, let's say, beyond fascination with technology? Well, I think for us, technology is, is essentially a neutral thing. You know, given the fact that we're sort of interested in, in the political side of things anyway, we would tend to see um, the way technology is used to be a politically oriented